you're listening to News Syndicalist, today we are at the organising summit that is taking place in Sheffield and we've asked a number of people to come and speak to us if they are doing some organising or they're involved in some interesting organising work. Um, I'm also joined by... Lydia from the London branch. And also... Uh, Andy from Manchester branch. In a New Syndicalist exclusive. Yeah, <laughs> first... <laughs> first uh, yeah, debut. We debut left, we left debut. you on the book. Yeah, finally <laughs> left me on. <laughs> not, just, not just editing anymore on the big, on the big screen, on the big podcast. <laughs> and I'm Grace. Grace, uh, who's from Sheffield. Yeah. Um, so Grace has been doing some research into organising care workers. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah. Um, what, what have you learned as a result of this research? What are some of the strengths and weaknesses um, in care worker organising? So I used to do care work, so the research that I'm doing, I'm doing it as part of a PhD and it's kind of come out of that and I basically did a proposal complaining about how there's not much union activity in care work yeah. and then got the funding on the back of that. Okay. Um, yeah, and then at the moment I've been looking at domiciliary companies, so home care, um, and then I'll be going into a residential care company as well. Mm-hmm. But in home care there's very low membership. Um, yeah, just incredibly low awareness of what a union is. Um, so even though the companies that I'm, the one that I'm looking at is uh, got a recognition agreement with GMB. Oh, there's actually a, a, a contract. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so the workers are covered by a union contract, but they don't. They don't. Know. Yeah, so the that manager like <laughs> like wanted to have some kind of connection with GMB, uh, so got them involved. Okay. And then he, when he gets new uh, recruits in, he like gives them all the information about GMB, and then no one joins, um, and no one knows what it is. Okay. <laughs> so what, do you possible. think that's what? What do you think are the main reasons that people aren't kind of going for union membership at that point? Um, they even though they see the leaflet, like they don't really understand what it is, and think they think of it as like like they seem to get it confused with the CQC. Um, so like the Care Quality Commission that regulates care uh, and just with like general council bodies, they don't really understand that it's something that's for them. They think of it as something completely uh, on the side of management, I guess. Um, and yeah, a lot of people are like incredibly put off by the price. So when I was trying to tell some people what a union was, uh, when I was interviewing them, and then they asked, oh, do you have to pay to be in it? And I said, yes. And they just like laughed at me. <laughs> like, well, that's why no one did it. Um, <laughs> even though it's, it can be quite cheap, it's still too much when, um, yeah. when they're working on such tight finances. So, I mean, do you think the, the reason people feel it's something to do with management is because it's presented as part of that induction? Did yeah. you say by a manager? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah it's I would very, think that. <laughs> yeah. It's understandable. Yeah. I mean, the manager I've interviewed him as well, and he sort of says that because he's he's, he's always been in a union, he's quite left wing, uh, so that's why he wants him to come along. But then that could be a negative. He could be like accidentally making it a negative thing by introducing it in that way. Um, and office staff who I interviewed said that they even though GMB will give them leaflets, they never come down and talk to them. They're like, well, how, we don't know enough about them. They don't bother coming to talk to us. Um, so there's that as well, I think. They don't feel like it's really like a personalised thing where the union actually cares whether they're in it. Cool. So is your, your research has mainly been interviewing workers in this yeah, care company? Yeah. Then? yeah. Okay. Uh, the ethics is too difficult to try and interview like, recipients of care. Yeah, of course. Cool. And like, what do you kind of hope comes out of it? Um, well, I don't, yeah, it's difficult. I think I, I'm kind of looking at it in like a big broad Marxist framework where I'm trying to think of like... Big broad Marxist <laughs> I'm trying to like work out the points of resistance in care, basically. Okay. Um, so, and what points trade unions end up, uh, sort of, yeah, acting towards to resist. And... I think a lot of it is not not so much in that relationship between worker and manager, but because there's also the role of the council. So the workers uh, have a lot of grievances, but they're towards like council and government policy more broadly. So it's hard to put like 
a traditional Marxist framework on it when it's to do with like circulation of capital as well. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Isn't our in Sheffield there's a is there a care there's a care workers industrial branch, is that right? There's much we do have care workers, yeah. It's interesting that you say that you've been focusing on workplaces where there are contract agreements because I'd say that's probably the minority actually. Yeah. Um, is it the place that you're obviously don't want to reveal too much, but the place that you're <laughs> focusing on, is it public or, or private sector? So it's private, yeah. It's private, okay. Well, that's interesting because that is a rarity, I'd say, that a lot of uh, the, the unionised workers tend to be public sector. Yes, yeah. Um, I, yeah, the, the, it does... It, it seems like a lot of the bigger, like, residential care providers, um, like HC1, like, big ones like that, which are, like, financialised private equity companies, mm -hmm. have union agreements, um, which again is not coming from the membership, but is something that the managers want to do, and it, for them it is more of an insurance policy. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it seems so like disconnected from politics in a way, yeah. when whether companies do have that. I suppose it's it's that um, contract union, service unionism, yeah. to its yeah. logical conclusion, right? That yeah. these are two partners that work together. Um, in the last session that I was in, um, one of the members was rather cynically saying that. It was a mutually beneficial relationship mm -hmm. that companies create disciplinary hearings so union organisers have work to do yeah. <laughs> and they kind of feed off each other um, and yeah I think there is a bit of that that goes on in terms of the uh, relationship with it, of the hierarchy um, between these two companies. Um, in terms of what you were saying about um, thinking about resistance points there's been a lot of uh, writing and theory about sort of social and care-based work being a lever that can be used um, in a broader strategy, like the idea of the social strike, mm -hmm. so people withdrawing social care as a, as a way of kind of, as a transformative activity. Um, what do you think about those ideas? Is it possible to, especially if it's someone who's so vulnerable and dependent, is it possible to withdraw labour as an act of mm -hmm. bringing about change, or do you think that yeah, we have to tread a bit more? Um, yeah, I think it, it is a big reason why people don't join unions is because they associate it just with strikes and then because they're so emotionally connected in their job to the recipients of care, um, that feels like something really difficult. Like I had an interview with a care worker the other day um, and she said, oh, if you have a heart, then you can never go on strike in care work. And it was just this moment where you get like the perfect quote when you're doing interviews. <laughs> Um, and yeah, it's a shame. It's the opposite of the perfect quote for us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's going to be a lot of work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. although in, like American, uh, America is much better, the unionization and care work there. Mm -hmm. And they've done strikes which are like 15 minute strikes and things like that. That's interesting. I and I think that could be something which people would be more likely to engage in. Mm -hmm. And just kind of strikes where you're. I don't know, maybe like related to paperwork and things like that, which the company really needs you to do, but the yeah recipient of care doesn't like it's not going to affect their health if you do it or not. Uh, although it might, yeah, I don't know. It gets complicated, I think, but there probably are ways around it. And it's a shame that that initial response is just you have you must be uncaring if you're going to go on strike when it, it um, like a term that's used <coughs> in literature is like prisoner of love. Um, where you're accepting these working conditions because you have this relationship with the person you're giving care to and it's really difficult. <laughs> so a lot of the, I mean from my kind of reading of it, a lot of the strikes that go on in the US in the kind of healthcare sector, um, especially by nurses, are over <coughs> staffing ratio levels. So rather than actually it being about pay or about nurses' own, well, I mean, it is their conditions, but it's also about the level of like staffing, uh, like to like nurse to patient, which mm -hmm. is, um, I think, is one potential way to get around um, that idea of the prisoner of love type thing that you're talking about. Like, obviously, if you're on strike for your patients, like for, to make sure you have a, a set ratio of nurses um, to patient, then you can't really be argue to be doing it for yourself like you're doing yeah. it for the people you um, you're caring for I think obviously that's 
potentially a bit different on the care home. But is that, I mean, what are the, what kind of industrial action is taking place in Sheffield that you know about in terms of care work? And is it, um, is it I, th- I think a lot of it's focused more on, on the council. So like Unison has the ethical care charter, yeah. um, getting councils to sign that. So that's the kind of like way that they're trying to improve working conditions. Um, but yeah, it's not, not so much industrial action proper. Um, but I, I think a really good way to get around it is something we were talking about in the previous group. Um, it's like coalitions between uh, like service users is a bit of a horrible term, but mm-hmm. service users uh, and care workers because they're affected by like the same things. Like it's all quite connected up, like more so than in a lot of jobs. Um, like care workers having issues with the 10 minute, 15 minute calls. Yeah. Um, that's something which the the services is going to have an issue with as well mm-hmm. um, and it's like not getting paid travel time if they were getting paid that like that could uh, make the quality of care better and just trying to connect it up in a way that still recognises that it's like a um, there's an employment relationship there I think so yeah not taking away from the fact that they are being exploited um, well, I think some literature on care and service work in general, like really tries to make it be about, like less about the manager and employer employee exploitation relationship. And I think you want to keep that there, but then also look at new coalitions. Mm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, just uh, one further question, unless anyone else has anything they'd like to add. Um, have you so have you worked, been working with GMB on this, or have have they responded to your research? And how do they see what you're doing? Uh, yeah, so the companies that I got in touch with, uh, I got in touch with through GMB, so they've been really helpful actually. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it seems it's always just so down to like finding an individual who's interested in what you're doing and really pushes for it. Mm-hmm. And I was really lucky with that. Mm-hmm. That um, the person that I emailed just seemed excited about it, and okay. yeah. Although, it's, yeah, it's a bit difficult because there's that sectarianism always. And she was like, oh, you're also approaching Unison and not wanting me to be doing that too so that it could be like their thing. Yeah. Um, but then obviously I want to look at like other kinds of union resistance as well. So I want to look at IWW and like the union that Andy's setting up and things like that because all these tactics are so different. So uh, we do have this ongoing series a series that we started called uh, Too Many Men, where we're looking at the concentration of gender in particular sectors. Mm-hmm. And, and care work is one of those ones where it's predominantly um, women who work in those jobs. Mm-hmm. Um, and tends to be that the trade union organisers and the officials tend to be men. Mm-hmm. Or, or is that that uh, the gender, gender representation in the workforce is not represented in the union structures? Have you found that that's the case? In Sheffield, or is it, or is it different? Um, I, th- the, I think it, it's quite balanced in the, the, peop- the people that I've been approaching, mm-hmm. um, but I have found that, that yeah, the, the balance within the workplace, the company that I'm looking at has about 110 employees and is owned by a man, um, and there's two male care workers out of that 110. Like it's and then when you when you interview people, they refer to the rest of the staff as the girls. Like it's all it's just completely assumed that it's only going to be women there. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I have found when I was working in care as well that men tend to be in like management roles a lot more. Um, but I'm not I'm not sure really with the the union makeup as well. And then, and then do you, do you why do you feel that is that often is it because of kind of gendered expectations of management and, and kind of care and that kind of association? Yeah, well, the areas of care where there's more men seems to be with support work. Yeah. Um, and often men will, well, when I was interviewing someone from the home care company, she was saying that men would come and apply for jobs and then not want to do any personal care a lot of the time. Or uh, even, even the two guys that they had working there, sometimes they couldn't find work because a lot of the recipients of care don't want men coming to them, even the men don't want men 
providing care for them. So there's that issue as well that you might not be able to find the shift even if there are men willing to do it because it's so like entrenched the gender expectation that you want a woman doing the care <laughs> from like all angles. Mm. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you for coming to speak to us. That's all right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. We're talking to Tom, who's the London Regional Organiser, um, who's been doing a lot of work in organising the recent Uber Eats and delivery strikes in London. Cool. So, yeah, could you um, tell us a bit about what you've been doing? Maybe give us a bit of background about the Uber Eats dispute for people who don't know. Yeah, sure. So, um, I think it was on the 19th of September, Uber... Um, drastically cut the pay per drop, which is the only way that drivers are paid for Uber Eats, um, and it went from something like four pounds twenty after um, the fee, the twenty percent fee that drivers pay to Uber, to two pound eighty. Um, and what happened was that in response to this, the drivers across London went on a spontaneous strike, um, and there was hundreds and hundreds involved in that. And they you had, they organised extremely militant pickets, so um, people were delocking people's motorbikes, people were having fist fights, you know, on the picket lines, Pete scabs would come back with mates with knives, it was very, you know, it was, it was proper messy. Um, and they also had a massive rally in central London at the Uber Eats office, so, you know, Uber managers came down, got shouted back, they went driving around causing chaos, and they also had flying pickets in different parts of London, for example, around North Finchley. Um, so that was super militant. Um, what happened after that is, the suggestion came up that there should be a national career strike because um, just before that there had been a strike in uh, Glasgow and then there was one in Cardiff and then there was one in Plymouth um, and then someone suggested that we should coordinate that with the October 4th fast food strike being organised by some of the TUC unions um, and then what, what happened is London didn't have any experience really organising careers because it's sort of been this agreement with the IWGB doing that um, but we had these careers come to us who said that they won't get into details but weren't working with the IWGB or the IWGB wasn't working with them um, so we agreed to have a go at that um, and what that meant was just like two weeks of whirlwind organising um, where we very quickly had to, had to somehow organise an industry that we didn't really have any, any experience with um, and, and organise a strike I mean it, it was very clear these workers wanted to go on strike so it's not like we were forcing anything um, but we had to reach across London, which has somewhere about 100 McDonald's, and the streets is largely organised by McDonald's. So um, we uh, split the city up into six areas, and we had six teams who would have to organise themselves, their own activities in terms of reaching out to drivers, build their own contacts, you know, do their own leafleting, um, and, and find those organisers, most importantly, who'd be able to organise their own fleets. And uh, would you, would you, was it successful, do you think? Like, what, was this uh, mobilisation, did it work? Is it, is it brought things forward? Are there things to be learned as a result of it? So, uh, it's definitely a mixed picture. Um, obviously, London you know, is a city of about 10 million people, and it's difficult to know how many couriers there are, but there's several thousand, so there could be anywhere between five and 10,000 food couriers. We certainly managed to organise, you know, hundreds of them out on strike. We're not sure how many, but but several hundred, like maybe as many as five hundred, um, and we had between 10 and 15 picket lines. Some of those were organic picket lines, and some of those were by supporters who helped picket. Um, but on the other hand, you had a lot of people who joined in the strike who didn't really understand, you know, what a picket line was. For example, they just didn't work and they went home or, or you know whatever went to fix their bikes and that would mean that scabs could move in and, and do the work instead which undermined it then we had other areas which we couldn't fully reach or couldn't fully persuade and those just continued to work um, we also tried to have a rally in central london which was a flop um, and the riders just didn't turn out to that and I, that was definitely a learning curve for us because they very they very much were up for joining into the strike and so that was easy to speak to them about but the perhaps the rally was a bit more synthetic and it was a lesson that we need to have those people uh, you know being front and center of even even small sort of tactical decisions like that mm. um, so overall I think it was you know it was, it was it was 
it's a huge city, so there's a lot more to do than in other cities that the Career Network covers. I think there's a, you know, we've never organised anything like that, either in London or across the IWW, so there's a lot to be proud with, um, pr proud of, um, and there's, l there's a lot of prospect for future action, but yeah, there's also lots of space to improve. Mm. What do you, what do you think about the coverage of other unions on that day? So, um, Baker's Union, who were organising in McDonald's, yes, the Weatherspoons, they got quite good press coverage. There was a lot of like, you could tell their press teams were working quite well yeah. on getting themselves kind of visible on that day. Um, do you think that was a weakness or is, are they always going to be good at that kind of thing? Um, are those are those as genuine action struck industrial actions as what was happening with the careers? Uh, so I think there was no th no for sure no like it was hugely disproportionate the level of coverage that those unions got compared to the number of workers that were participating and really the s the industrial significance of what they were doing compared to us. So overall, they had way more coverage than us. Overall, our action not only pulled in many, many times more workers, but um, you know, the, the significance of that on an industrial level um, was, was far greater. So, you know, obviously these are, these are professional unions with full-time staffers, full-time press teams. They know exactly what they're doing and they can you know, roll out the labor top, top brass who can, who can chat them up and they can use yeah, their links. There are lots of MPs tweeting about it. Yeah. So a lot of Labour MPs tweeting about it. Yeah, so the, you know, they, can, they can totally do that and... Um, Not using the IWW logo. Yeah. Promotion, <laughs> I have to say. Yeah. Understandably. So yeah, yeah you know, they, and they got, uh, that's, those are the main people that were covered in, in you know, the mainstream media. Um, and there were also bits when we were very obviously overlooked, both in media reporting and in, um, uh, even sh at the rally at one point, you know, we had a speaker go up speaking from the couriers and they were introduced to being from the GMB union. And we obviously had words about that. But, um, but I think the main thing to, to, to point out with these things is, like, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be too worried about that stuff because, like, you know, who is reading those reports in The Guardian or the BBC or, or The Times is not the couriers who speak Portuguese as a first language or Arabic or Romanian. They're not, they're not the ones that care about that and we're the ones reaching through to them through the, uh, you know, their WhatsApp groups and, and on the streets. Um, are there plans to build on, on the strikes? Like, What are the next steps for doing that? Um, so, yeah, I mean, what, this, this challenge is, um, is making us reevaluate what it is to be a union and what it is to be the IWW and that's happening across the UK both. But, in, in locally as well um, and I think the main thing you know that we can do is, is provide coordination especially because these aren't technically they're not employees and um, there's limits to what we can do in a traditional sense but we can do something in, in you know the real power sense of a union and in the old school sense organizing people on the streets um, but these guys are very you know they're very independent minded they're very well self-organized and so the main thing we can do is just put them in contact with each other and so our next challenge is finding a way to you know to coordinate these thousands of workers across the city, the size of London, the geographical size and the, and the population size. And I think once we put them, if we succeed in putting them in touch, um, that will that will in itself be amazing because suddenly you'll have people from all sorts of different uh, countries and backgrounds seeing that they're in a situation where they share these conditions and these grievances with, with other nationalities and people in other parts of the city. Um, and so they'll get that, that real sense of, you know, like, like work solidarity and they will, I think, take the initiative and, and plan the next steps themselves and then it will be our role to, to facilitate that and roll it out in London and beyond London. Okay, thank you for coming to speak to us first today. No problem, cheers. Cool, so joining us now is Anne from London IWW and Angry Workers of the World. Um, going to be talking about the West London warehouse organising campaign and conditions there. Um, Tell us about the project you've been involved in. Uh, so a small group of us moved to West London about four and a half years ago um, with the idea of getting rooted in a place, um, getting jobs, in jobs um, 
locally in some of the bigger warehouses and seeing what the potential for organising is there. Um, we're interested in that area because there's a lot of warehouses and factories, there's thousands of workers all working there, a lot of them work in food processing and logistics um, as, are associated around Heathrow Airport. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a kind of vibrant, diverse area, but the workers are kind of in a strategic position where 60% of the food that goes into central London, for example, goes through this western corridor, it's called. So collectively they have quite a lot of power, but individually they're quite weak because a lot of them don't speak English as a first language or don't speak English at all. Um, they have immigration worries, um, they're on minimum wages, there's a lot of agency workers. Um, so yeah, structurally, in, individually they're quite weak. But obviously, if they do get together, then they could have quite a big impact. So, and also, a lot of the people live and work in that area, and they move around that area and those kind of workplaces. So there is a kind of common reference point. And generally, in London, it's just so huge; it's difficult to kind of you know keep track of where people work, where they live, where they're going, and whatever. So, it seemed like quite a good kind of place to concentrate ourselves. Is there uh, any trade union density already there? Yeah, like I think there's this idea that there's these kind of workplaces, no one knows who they are, it's unorganised. It's not true. I mean, obviously the agency workers, they're, they're not unionised. Um, but in some of the bigger workplaces, I mean, you have like big Tesco's warehouses, Sainsbury's warehouses, um, massive food factories that cater to all the major supermarkets. There's generally a union there, but obviously only for the permanent workers and in terms of their effectiveness, I mean most of the workers are still on minimum wage so there's not any trust in the union. Um, if there is, yeah, if there is membership then yeah, there's not so much kind of, yeah, trust in the ability for the union to actually improve things. Mm -hmm. There's uh, been increasing talk about small towns as a uh, focus area for the left, both in terms of the growth of far right ideas, but also as a neglected area of organising. Is that why you, you were attracted to this area, or is it the strategic and economic value, or both? Um, well, yeah, I mean, the left is, there is no left really there. Um, so it was a kind of uncharted territory in that respect. Um, but that that's also causes a problem because if something did happen there, support from the left and the wider um, kind of communities would be important to, to carry that on. Um, and there is a lack of community there in a sense. I mean, there's kind of religious communities, people go to temples, things like that. But in terms of a working class culture, because there's so many different people coming from different places, a lot of new immigration as well, um, hierarchies within specific communities, like class differences within a community. It's quite difficult to, you know, go to places where people meet. There's a lot of people who drink in the parks, or um, yeah, they might go to a temple and do their religious stuff. But you know, apart from that, it's not. Yeah, it's difficult to get in there. So the workplace is the kind of place where you have that mixing, and so that's kind of our starting point. At the same time, we realise that it's not just about work, that people have problems outside of work, especially with housing and immigration and welfare and benefits. So we have a solidarity network every Monday and we meet um, in local places in McDonald's, an Indian cafe and the Asda cafe and people can drop in if they've got a problem. And so they might have a, a housing problem but they also work locally so the idea is to maintain links with them and then down the line they might have a workplace problem and vice versa and so then we, the idea was that we needed to build actually the local uh, group the local network um, because there is no left so we have to build our own kind of working class structures um, what do you think has gone like particularly well um, for the campaign and kind of what do you think the pitfalls and the problems have been um, the main problem is um, capacity, I would say. 
Um, there's normally a core of between like two and four people who have to keep everything running. And we all do full-time jobs. We do the Solidarity Network. We also do a newspaper. Um, and then we do this kind of West London campaign with the IWW. So, I mean, it takes a lot of kind of energy and um, it would just be good to have kind of new blood all the time. Um, you know, we have been lucky, you know, we've got, we've had people come and stay with us who get involved, but then people are kind of transient and they leave and, yeah, it'd be good to just have like a core group of 10 people all the time who are just kind of dedicated to doing that and that would like make everything a lot easier, but, you know, we do what we can. But the thing about the West London campaign was it did bring in a lot of new people who we never met before, who were kind of interested in what we were doing and... Yeah, it was great to meet them. I think they also got a sense of, um, yeah, just like a different part of London, like what's going on. <laughs> yeah, it's really weird to like stand outside of a factory at like five in the morning. That just seems really like old school, like you yeah. do that. It's like when you take people from Sheffield to Rotherham or Barnsley, they're just, their minds are blown. They're just like, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> you know, warehouses and old factories and yeah, all the working class communities. Yeah. yeah. A big contrast. Yeah, so it was just good to kind of have that exchange yeah. and um, for people to know that like we're there, we're going to be there for the long haul. So yeah. you know, people can drop in. We always need, yeah, some kind of help. And yeah, we got kind of, <coughs> kind of contacts out of it. We found out loads about the factories that we didn't know anything about before, and um, we had quite a good um, success with one a sandwich factory where we got to. We had like three or four meetings with those workers. Um, I mean, that's a whole other story about what what happened there. But I mean, there are these kind of glimmers of you know something potentially happening. Mm. Just yeah, you have to be in it for the long haul, really. Yeah, I do think though that these are kind of untapped potentials a lot of the time because I remember we did a very very poorly organised, very poor effort campaign to be fair in Sheffield, where we just it was John Lewis and we just stood at five o'clock in the morning when the cleaners were going into John Lewis and we said, do you want to join the union? We are the union reps. And actually, for the initial part of it, it worked quite effectively because I think people just people just weren't talking to them and they're there and they're all there at the same time coming into work. So I do think, and there's, yeah, I do think there's like warehouses outside Sheffield, um, particularly in these kind of places of historic deindustrialization. There's still like concentrations of work. There's some huge warehouses, distribution centers. And yeah, people don't really go down there and engage with those workers. And I think people think, oh, they're not going to take a leaflet because like, everyone in London is so kind of like blinkered. <laughs> you know, they just see the chuggers on the street and you're just like, oh my God, not talking, not talking. But there, I mean, it is kind of different. If you're standing outside someone's workplace and you've got a leaflet especially for them yeah. and targeted like to that workplace and that the problems in that workplace, I mean, it's kind of different. Yeah. You get a different reaction, you know. Do you think the Solidarity Network has kind of helped build that trust that has been a problem with the way they've engaged with unions in the past, like not trusting GMB because they're still on minimum wage? Like, has, do you think the Solidarity Network has played like an important role in kind of giving you a bit of, yeah, giving them trust in you, like in the workplace? Uh, yeah, definitely. I think if you were just doing the workplace stuff, or if you're just doing the Solidarity Network stuff, it's easy to become demoralised because people kind of come and go. The point is, like, how do you um, build those links there? So I'll give you one example. Um, we just recently were contacted by some Punjabi truck drivers who were being screwed over by their employers. It was kind of fake um, uh, self-employment and whatever. Anyway, we kind of helped them over a period of a few weeks. And, you know, the idea is that they kind of give something back. So then we ask them, can you translate this um, leaflet that we're doing for this sandwich factory in, into Punjabi, which they did. And they even went with us on one of our trips to the sandwich factory and talked to workers there. So I think if a worker sees someone um, who is like them, who've had help from us in a different capacity, that also helps to build trust. So this was the kind of idea of the Solidarity Network, of kind of to strengthen um, the stuff that's happening in the workplaces and vice versa and so that was quite good yeah that was like encouraging mm -hmm. just one more question before we get the others yeah. um, when we were speaking uh, about 
career organising previously. Uh, one of the things that was mentioned there was that they saw the role of the union as different within that context. So the union was playing more of a facilitation role mm -hmm. and it was less traditional in the sense of signing up members. So it wasn't about we have X number of members, then we have, then we have density, then we can act. But it was about facilitating communication and, and kind of networks that are already existing. Do you feel that you have fulfilled a traditional role or are you exploring new ways of organising in this campaign? Um, we mainly use the union as a way to initially get people interested because people know what a union is. If you go with go to them and say, oh, we've got this solidarity network or we want to build a workers' network or, you know, people are like, what, what are you talking about? Whereas union is instantly kind of, I know what that is. Um, at the same time, you're always in this tension where you don't want to build any illusions for workers, like that the union is going to do everything for you. Um, I'm kind of always making sure that the, you're emphasising that the onus is going to be on the workers to do everything, that it is a different type of union. Um, but in our general kind of day-to-day, -day, um, like Solidarity Network and workplace organising, we generally use the IWW as a um, way to scare employers. So we don't, <laughs> we wouldn't, if someone comes to the Solidarity Network, we don't say, oh, you have to sign up to the IWW, but we'll tell them about the IWW and we'll send a scary IWW letter. And so this is a way of like getting results um, and just kind of using whatever tools that we've got at our disposal to kind of get workers interested, get a, some kind of result and keep going. So yeah, I guess kind of two questions just to like wrap it up. Um, kind of, you spoke about, you know, if you had like 10 people doing what you're doing in this area, like it would be much different. Like, what kind of projects there would you would you want to do with those 10 people and like what's your like next steps with the number of people you have um so if we had 10 people we could definitely uh publish our newspaper more often it was supposed to be a kind of every three months we would um publish that newspaper and realistically it's been two a year which is like pretty pathetic um but we think a newspaper is important because all the stuff in the Solidarity Network, all the small things that workers do that is never picked up by the union. Um, a group of workers does a petition about something and it's totally self-organised. Um, that information needs to be carried on to like the workplace next door or for the next new tranche of workers that comes in because, you know, people think that other people are not doing anything so the newspaper is important but we just haven't had enough like um, time to do it I mean actually we can write all the stuff we've got loads of material but it's you know distributing it takes a long time um, so we would definitely do that uh, we would if we had people that were working locally we would have we would able to have more reports from those workplaces we would get to know those workplaces better uh, the idea is if you start in a workplace you would do some kind of organizing attempts there so i mean for that exponentially to kind of grow to gain all those experiences and then share it i mean it would be that would be great and then yeah so in the ne near future what are we doing well we're just uh, well, at the moment I am kind of in another, so my workplace, is a, it's a big food factory and I may become a union rep there because while we do a, have an emphasis on worker self-organisation, so we have like our own independent workplace bulletins, we'll hand out leaflets outside of work, we'll do something as a group of workers, worker to worker. Um, in that particular workplace, it was very difficult because workers were, were too scared and they weren't going to do anything outside of the existing union. So then the idea was to, okay, let's get, let's, I'll become a rep in that union and see what's possible to do. And luckily there is space to do something. Um, there's not so, you know, the workers, the other reps are not interested. Um, yeah, there's a bit of leeway to encourage workers to do something that's not going to be immediately like 
um, steamrolled over by the bureaucracy. So at the moment, a lot of my time is kind of taken up by trying to encourage worker self-organisation within the union structure in a big workplace. Um, and yeah, we're carrying on with the solidarity network and writing stuff and yeah, kind of waiting for for new people to come. Great. Thank you for coming to speak to us. Okay, thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs>